when we look at the Klamath River, especially the lower river, we really should be focusing on all the species that are present, sturgeon, lamprey, suckers. These fish need specific things at specific times. Salmon require habitat and water quality during their adult migration, their holding periods, spawning, egg incubation, the early fry rearing. It's critical that those fish find over summer habitat. And in the system, temperature is extremely important. So thermal refugia is a very important item. There are three primary pathogens that are affecting the animals. One of them is Ceratomyx ashasta, another is Parva capsula mini bicornis, and then the third is a bacterial uh, disease called columnaris. We have noticed in our surveying anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of the juvenile salmon out migrating in the last few years have been infected by Ceratomyx ashasta. Over 90 percent of the out migrants are infected with parva capsula. Because of that ratio, you can see quite quickly that there's dual infections occurring, and it's those dual infections that are extremely lethal to the fish. The Lost River and Short Nose Sucker are resident fish in the upper basin. Uh, upper Klamath Lake has large blue green algae blooms that result in poor water quality conditions. Low, de low dissolved oxygen concentrations and high pH and ammonia, which stress and lead to fish die-offs for a number of the, the fish. And in uh, recent years, we've had some major die-offs of some of our adult sucker populations that have really impacted the status of the fish. The, the biggest threat that we've identified deals with the water quality conditions in, in our system, Upper Klamath Lake, which impacts all life stages of the fish from the larvae through the adults. And so that, that is kind of a, a challenge for us in, in how we can influence water quality or provide some areas of refuge for the fish to allow for improved survival. What are the unanswered questions or what are the areas that we need to figure out in order to be able to improve the situation? Well, th there's one that comes to my mind, and that's the role that the connected wetlands play in the upper Klamath in terms of water quality. It deals with the decaying vegetation that uh, would have contributed humic dark mm -hmm. water, peat mm -hmm. water, to the system. And there's some pretty good evidence that this affected the water quality in a favorable way in terms of holding the pH down and perhaps even having some other direct effect on the algae. The implication of that is that these wetlands played a major role with this peat water advecting out into the lake and around the edges, the, the upper edges and the fringes, which uh, would have supported some of the populations. In particular in regards to water quality coming out of Upper Klamath Lake, mm -hmm. um, we've got some major problems there where it actually turns basically into a dead zone for certain times of the year. So I think that we really need to put some research into trying to determine are there some ways that we can clean up that water. I just think we need more years of study to see what environmental factors or what factors there are out there that are related to the incidence of disease. There needs to be a whole lot of coordination and everything around it. to look at the main stem. Certainly that's where we're seeing the bulk of the disease problems happening. How do we have a better understanding of, the stock, of stock identification for the different species and runs in the Klamath Basin for, I'll start with Chinook to begin with. For instance, in my case, how can I tell from the Salmon River how a spring chinook, who is a spring chinook, once and gets outside the Salmon River? Mm -hmm. How can we track those to, under, to have a better understanding of their life history and the bottlenecks that they're facing? Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that we set up a real clear effectiveness monitoring uh, program so when we're taking actions, we we're able to look at them and understand those actions to figure out what worked and what didn't, and that basically is an adaptive management approach. The issue with, with the climate change and increasing temperatures could be a confusing factor in a lot of this. And so being able to track that carefully with other factors I think are going to be important. That and associated with drought management issues that also affect temperature okay. become important science, long-term science needs. Or we need to have 
an upfront plan for essentially how we're going to monitor and that that be consistent and ongoing throughout the basin. And then where do I find the data I need when I need it and is the data this group collected comparable to the group over here? Did they use similar protocols and so on? And I think that also plays into what Bob said about, you know, understanding how these other confounding factors may play in. If we don't yeah. have a long-term consistent monitoring program on the basin, we can't tease out these other issues. There's need for consistent funding sources to allow for this kind of kind of long-term long trend monitoring for these basic kind of water quality parameters. And as Steve was saying, there needs to be a framework for having some kind of coordination among all the entities doing monitoring to come together and, and, and make some decisions about what are the important water quality monitoring that needs to be conducted and pooling resources because the reality is resources are tight. Very important for us to incorporate wherever we can where there's experiential knowledge that can help us truth the science that we're learning mm -hmm. in different ways so when we say something someone goes oh yeah that really makes sense because I saw that on the ground happening. Let's talk about restoration needs. Based on what we know so far what's the kind of work that needs to be done? Actually understanding exactly the role these wetlands played is important, really important in understanding with the restoration. It, it, to me, that's key to the whole system. You're looking for higher water quality, you're talking about potential long-term issues related to salmon migration and even into the upper. All of this has to be kind of structurally put back together in some way. Even though it might not look the same, it has to have the same kind of function. These wetlands that are upstream from the lake have uh, subsided. The ground has subsided. So if you, when you let the lake level in, you have, in many cases, very deep deeper sections, they're not going to be wetlands for a while, portions will be. Mm -hmm. So, but that there still could be the, the function. If, if you ask a bunch of scientists what we need, it's going to be research. Mm -hmm. I do think, you know, the resource problems are out there and we need to yeah. move on with management. Yeah. And a lot of t people talk about adaptive management, mm -hmm. but we need to do true adaptive management where we're taking the science, we're modifying our management as we learn more, and as our monitoring shows whether what we have done is effective or not effective.